Good morning. I want to start this morning with my favorite colic, the colic for purity, which is in our service of Holy Eucharist. Let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, many of you will recognize this as a standard colic that we use in many of our liturgies, and it has recognizable elements. It starts with an invocation or address. In this case, God could be any member of the Trinity. And then it has an acknowledgement, a description of a characteristic of God. To you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. There's then a petition, a request for grace, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. And then there's an aspiration, what we would do if we received what we asked for, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. And then finally, there is a pleading through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and a final response, amen. Now, I'm going over these elements with you because I'm going to ask you to think about those elements during class, during our discussion today, and we'll close class by constructing a colic as a class. I'd like to do this this term and use that as our way of praying together. So I will give you those elements, but I will ask you to add your own version of that, which hopefully will come out of your heart during the course of the class. You might now think about one that makes sense to you, that whether it's God or a characteristic of God or the petition or the aspiration, and just be prepared to add that when we come to saying our colic at the end of class. By Christmas, we'll have this down pat, I'm absolutely certain. And I'm also confident, or at least I'm hopeful, that going through this exercise makes class more meaningful, but also makes worship more meaningful to you as you think about the elements of the colic. It helps a lot when you're asked to say the blessing, I've got to say. Those moments when somebody says, you say the blessing, it's nice to know these elements. You can make them happen. All right. So this term, the Advent term of old fashioned, we're going to look at what I've been arguing all along. So I've been arguing that at the core of yourself, at your heart, is God. That's the basic thesis I've been arguing. At the core of yourself is God. So for the next several Sundays, we're going to look at who are you? What is the self? How do you find yourself? And what are you doing spiritually when you do that? We're going to look at that as an individual matter. How do you construct yourself or think about yourself? And we're going to do it as a community matter. How does that self live into community, in particular, a Christian community? Now, I'm going to use my model for this, Maundy Thursday. You'll remember that on Maundy Thursday, when we get the mandamus from God, from Jesus, we also have two teachings which I think are really powerful for this purpose. The first is the foot washing, and the second is Holy Eucharist. Now, I didn't come up with all of this myself. Much of it is deep, all of it is deeply rooted in the mystical tradition of the church. And we're going to use as our guide through that tradition, a woman by the name of Beatrice Bruteau. Beatrice Bruteau who was born out in the Midwest and raised a Baptist, became kind of adventuresome when it came to religion. She wound up studying Hindu philosophy with a Swami who lived in New York, and then got two degrees from Fordham University, one in mathematics and one in philosophy. She, with her husband, who was also teaching at Fordham at the time, then started a number of periodicals that focused on mysticism, but became particularly interested in East and West. 
and how the mystical thought of the Eastern Church and the Western Church varied, yet spoke to each other. And out of that and her fascination with Teilhard de Chardin began to think about the evolution of consciousness, the evolution of consciousness. But what I like about her is she is brilliant and precise and practical. When she says things, you tend to know what she's saying, or at least after a while have confidence that you will know. And when she talks about a practice, I feel like I kind of know what to do. And she winds up decoding, at least for me, a lot of the images that we're used to hearing, particularly when we come into the experience of God. An experience, of course, that we can't fully understand, but we can always experience. So Beatrice Bruteau, she, as you saw in your email, has a book called The Holy Thursday Revolution. It's available in the bookstore. You can order it just by clicking on the link that's provided in the old fashioned email. I'm gonna be referring to things throughout her canon. She takes this idea and she develops it over time. Berteau was born in the 30s and died in 2014 when she was living in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, kind of interestingly. For somebody that I had never heard of, it was quite interesting to learn that Thomas Merton and David Stendhal Rast and Cynthia Brigeau and Elia Delio and a number of other writers we do know very well all loved Beatrice Bruteau. So she's got a wonderful credential in her friends and in her books. But many of us had really not heard of her before. I think you're going to like her. And if you want that book, it's available in the bookstore. All right. So one of the things that we all know is that Christianity is a mystery religion. And mystery comes from mysterion in the Greek, but in the Latin, it's sacrament. The idea that we are using visible things to guide us into invisible graces, right? You've heard us say that many times around the sacraments of baptism or Holy Eucharist, but that is also true in many of the other things in Scripture the Annunciation, or the Feeding of the 5,000, or Monday Thursday, when the teachings that we receive have an outward and visible element that guide us into an inward and invisible grace. And that's what I think Berteau helps us see so well when we talk about the teachings of Monday Thursday. These mysteries, of course, are to guide us into transformation, are to guide us into union with God. But what does that mean? Well, let's start with how we construct our identities. When I ask you who you are, how do you answer that question? So if you've got a pencil and paper, pull it out. If not, just reflect on this. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to write down your answer, whatever comes to your mind about in answer to that question, who you are, what descriptions, for example, might reflect that. Take a moment and just write down a list if you or any other description you come up with in answer to the question, who are you?
Take another 30 seconds. All right. So when I make that list, I find myself going to some familiar categories. So I generally start with my family relationships. I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a son. And then I wind up looking at work relationships. I'm a priest of the church. Maybe some achievements work their way in there. You know, I was named this or won that or lost that or made that mistake. I often find myself going into handicaps at this point, wanting to be clear that I've caveated all of those achievements to show my humility. And maybe if I get a little bit deeper, I'll start identifying ideals. I'm somebody who seeks the truth or desires justice. And then of course, I have all these aspirations to be certain things. They are fewer and fewer as I grow older, but they're always there not so far below the surface. I suspect many of you had a similar experience, but I want to push you a little bit because also in there are class memberships, right? So ethnic identity or economic class or education level or physical attributes or sexual orientation or nationality or church membership, probably the most important thing about you. If those aren't expressly named, they're probably lurking below some of those descriptions, some of those adjectives. Well, what Bruteau says is that for us to list those things and think of ourselves as being those things is quite natural. And yet the spiritual journey, the growing closer to God, is movement beyond them. And I'll bet you've already experienced this, having something happening to you dominate who you think you are, right? Your feelings of pleasure or pain or pride or shame. You, over time, just by living life. Ramsey, can you help me with the volume, please? With prayer, you have learned to distance yourself a bit from those adjectives, to realize that those descriptions of you are not all of you. And I think in the Spiritual life, you're constantly learning to gain more and more perspective. We're constantly learning to back away from more and more of those adjectives, realizing that that isn't all we are. We're something more. And of course, as we do that, I think we become more and more open to relationships, right? But the key to all of that is, according to Bruteau, that looking at those adjectives, those descriptions of ourselves as being ourselves, causes us to dedicate a lot of energy to protect them. And the way we protect them is by looking for things, building up things, arguing about things that separate us from other people. Because those adjectives only have meaning to me, they're only of value if you don't have them too. I was picking on David Llewellyn recently when we were talking about this as a class and this tendency that many of us have to just keep on looking for adjectives until I find one that you don't have. Something that you can admire in me because you don't have it. And that can prove to be exhausting over time. And the more talented, wonderful people you meet, the more anxious you can find yourself becoming if you get trapped in that place. It's a vicious circle. That, I think, is what Jesus was talking about when he advised us not to build up treasures on earth, not to build up these descriptions of ourselves where we place all of our value. That, I would argue, is also what was going on in the story about the laborers in the vineyard. Do you remember that, that kind of confusing story where some are brought out at the first hour and guaranteed a daily wage and then more and then more. And at the end of the day, another group is brought out and they're all paid the same thing. And what happens? The people have been laboring all day are not happy at all. 
And I would argue that's because they thought they were worth more, right? They thought their worth and value was about how well they had done and how long they'd been out there and how much sweat and toil they had exerted. And it simply wasn't fair for these latecomers to get the same grace. And while that may work in an economy of scarcity, it doesn't work in the economy of abundance, which we think is the spiritual life, right? That value that we were clinging to for our identity is that thing that was scarce, that wasn't available to other people, something that only we had. Okay. I'm arguing at the end that this way of being and defining ourselves is a trap. It's something we are naturally drawn to, and we have to do a lot of work to figure out that it's not helpful. And as we distance ourselves from it, we realize we are gaining more of what we might call eternal life. We are more alive, we're more open to relationship, and our natural propensity for bliss perhaps is freer to exhibit herself. We are literally more alive. Keep that idea of the self at hand because we're going to come back to that repeatedly through our discussions this term. And then let's move to, um, well, before I move off of that on to Monday Thursday, are there any questions just about the way that process works that Bruteau has described? Or clarifications you'd like to offer on my bumbling description of it all? Okay. Well, I hope that through the exercise and reflection over time, some of that will come to be part of your experience of yourself as well. So transformation then, as Bruteau describes it, is moving out of those descriptions into something else. And I've been maintaining that the core of ourselves are God. So the way we move into union with God is moving away from all of those other descriptions, which are finite in their character and only have value if we think other people don't have them. And that's what we have to give up. That's what we lose when we lose our life in order to save it. So Bruteau takes the first teaching of Maundy Thursday, the foot washing, and she says, pay attention to what's happening here. Those of you who've been to the Middle East, and whenever anybody's been in the Middle East, I love to ask them the minute they come back, what did you experience that makes you think about the Bible differently. I've never been, so this is all vicariously living through your experiences, but one common answer is, wow, it is really dusty. I mean, you get dust all over you know, wherever you go. I get foot washing now. It was a part of life, and it was, but the way it was done was also a part of life. If you had a servant, the servant washed your feet. You did not wash the servant's feet. If you were a man and didn't have a servant, your wife washed your feet. See the hierarchy? The person having their foot washed is the Lord, and the person doing the washing is the servant. And this is simply a micro example of the macro truth about how Roman society certainly, but Jewish society too, was organized. So when Jesus gets up from the table, rolls up his sleeves, as you will, wraps a towel around himself, falls down and starts washing feet, that is very disturbing. As we see in Peter's reaction, remember Peter saying, no, no, you won't wash my feet, because if you're screwing everything up like that, I don't even know where I fit anymore. You see how that works? That dominance paradigm that Rateau is describing is something that is often supported not just by the dominant players, but also by others who may be in a submissive state, but somehow have their identity tied to that submission. And then Jesus responds to Peter, if you don't do this, you can have no part of me, right? Which is to say, if you're going to adhere to that paradigm, that hierarchy of dominance, you're not ever going to get it because that's not the way we're going to live that principle of organizing life isn't what God is all about. My favorite example of this comes from Fred Rogers, that Presbyterian minister who we all know for his wonderful series. You will remember, perhaps, that 
throughout the race relations in this country, purity has been a major issue. Wilkerson in her book, Cast, dedicates a whole chapter to this. And the sanctity of water has often been part of that. In the early part of the 20th century, there was a young boy in Chicago who was actually beaten and killed because he crossed an imaginary line in Lake Michigan. Blacks were to swim on one side of the line, whites on the other side of the line. And there's a whole litany of tragic stories about public pools after integration where whites simply wouldn't swim in the same water as blacks. And when blacks did swim in them, whites would do various things to make that more difficult all because of this idea of purity and the sanctity of water. So in a 1969 episode of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, Officer Clemens, some of you may remember all this, Officer Clemens is the black police officer who works the beat, and they, it's a very hot day on summer, and Rogers asked Officer Clemens into his backyard. They sit down, take off their shoes, roll up their pants legs, and there they are, black man and white man, feet in the wading pool, as if to directly expose and attack the whole idea of water as sanctity, right? Of the impossibility of that, of the fact that they're both children of God. It is, I think, the same principle as foot washing. It is exactly what Jesus was saying, right? So there they are, Mr. Rogers having granted a uh, 20th century version of foot washing to Officer Clemens, giving him relief from the heat and joining with him in that exercise, serving him as a way of disregarding that hierarchy. So what Bruteau says is there's a whole paradigm of dominance that we in East and West have been living into for thousands of years. And yet that is the very paradigm that Jesus was trying to destroy, that Jesus was trying to reveal and in revealing it, undermining. Now I'm not, for those of you who are thinking about organizational dynamics, I'm not talking about growth hierarchies. I'm not saying there can never be anybody in charge. I'm saying that the dominance paradigm where some people are worth more than others and through the power that is accorded to them have the right to literally determine the amount of being of others. Does that make some sense? Think about uh, the feudal lords of England or those who are in power who are commanding armies. You don't have to look very far through Netflix before you can see ample evidence of this, right? To dominate is literally to determine the amount of being, how much life the servant can have, right? That's what it is. That's what makes it what it is. And that's what Jesus is fighting against, as if being is free and given by God, and the limitation of being by other people is counter to God's grace. And I think that's what Jesus is saying in the foot washing. It's more than just service. It's more than just the vulnerability of taking off your shoes and socks and exposing yourself, if you will. Both of those are included, but I think the power of it is the undermining of this dominance paradigm. And as I said, you don't have to go very far to find it, I don't think. But I'm going to test that theory. So I want to give you another couple of minutes, either to write down or to simply reflect on three instances where the Lord servant paradigm is present in your life. And it could be something you've seen a government or a nation do. It could be something that you've done yourself. It could be tragic or it could be very simple. For example, if you're in situations where you were, somebody is calling you by your last name, Reverend Maxwell, and I'm referring with a familiar first name, Mary Hunter, what's that all about? Take a couple of minutes and see if you can come up with three instances in your own lives where that Lord servant model is being preserved.
Okay, take another 30 seconds. And I want to tell you a personal story. I was down in Haiti years ago on a trip to kind of audit, if you will, a group that was drilling wells in villages down there. And we were trying to decide if we could be in partnership with them and what that partnership might look like. Um, we ultimately raised some money for them, but decided we couldn't because we couldn't figure out how to enter interpersonal relationships with the beneficiaries. It was more about raising money and drilling wells. But while I was down there, we met the bishop and he took us to a prison. And we went into that prison, which was overcrowded, of course, and he was explaining the conditions of that prison and that they were going to release seven young boys that day who had been picked up for various offenses over the last six weeks. And they'd been in this overcrowded cell with nothing to eat save that which their family provided for them, or in this case, the church, because they were all from somewhere else. So they didn't have any family there. They'd gotten into trouble for very minor offenses and gotten thrown into prison. If the church hadn't fed them, they wouldn't have been fed. Well, they brought these boys out and they sat them down and we had buckets of water and soap, and we were gonna wash their feet. So I joined with a couple of other priests from this diocese and the rest of the crew there, and we started washing their feet. And it was clear from their faces that they weren't entirely comfortable with this, and I was not comfortable at all. It felt exploitive to me. I didn't know what they thought I was doing. He couldn't really understand me and I couldn't really understand him. And I was tense and I didn't like it one bit. And then I noticed a priest who's a good friend of mine next to me. His name is Greg and he's the rector of uh, Holy Trinity in Decatur. And Greg was clearly not feeling any of the anxiety that it consumed me. He couldn't understand what his the person whose feet he was washing was saying either, and that guy couldn't understand Greg, but like watching an opera in who's, you know, in a, it's being sung in Italian, they knew each other anyway. And Greg's whole approach was loving and caring and compassionate. And the, per, little, the boy who was being released suddenly was uh, responding to him and you could sense a sense of relaxation and comfort and appreciation. And then it kind of hit me and I thought, in that moment, my anxiety was that not that I was exploiting this boy, but I didn't want to give up my superior position, right? It's not exploitation unless I think I'm doing it for that reason. But having Greg model a different way of being without my really having to think of it allowed me to be a different way. And it was this I found a new energy that I hadn't experienced before. And I went about my task in a different way. I stopped thinking about what I was going to get from it or what I was doing to him. And I was just washing his feet to wash his feet because we were telling him he was of value. And we were excited about his being released from prison and we wanted him to know that he wouldn't be alone. That's why I was washing his feet. And it was really fun, <laughs> but it was really fun because I moved, I think, from a discomfort to a comfort as I understood what my ministry was which was very, I think, ultimately, given Bruteau's model, had to do with giving up that paradigm. So a, uh, no pun intended, pedestrian example, right, of how deeply embedded in me that whole paradigm is, and, and maybe you will find that in yourselves as well, just as you go about your lives. And the wonderful thing about finding it is that there's a flip that occurs. The minute you find it, when you can acknowledge your role in it, and maybe it's being a submissive part of it, but nevertheless doing that for your own benefit or to get along, I don't know, but there's a flip that occurs and an energy that is present. And what's key and different is that that energy 
is not the energy of protecting your adjectives or your descriptions. It's not an anxious energy that is worried about whether your worth is going to be diminished. It is a creative energy, which is only of value when it's shared. I want to pause there because the question is why, if you were identifying these preservations of the Lord servant model in your own lives or in, your, in the world around you, why? Why are we doing that? Because what Jesus does, of course, is he washes their feet and then he gets up and he moves to the supper. He moves to Holy Communion. And him subverting one paradigm, the dominance paradigm, he immediately models another, a communion paradigm, right? Not a community paradigm, but a communion paradigm, where he holds up the bread and he says, take this and eat it. It is my body, which is given for you. And he holds up the wine and he says, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many. And then he says, do this as my memorial. Right? And in doing those things, he is creating another model, another model around which we organize our community, which we can organize our social relationships that requires us to be a different self. It requires us to move our energy away from the acquisition and protections of those things that are scarce and therefore of value and making us feel more worthy to creative energy that we will find within ourselves flowing in communion, which is of value only if it's shared. Love, compassion, empathy, those are of value only when they're shared. They're made to be shared and they're abundant. You give them away and you have more of it. You give it away and you get it back. You don't ever find yourself being out of love. You may find it difficult to love in certain situations, but loving will generate love. So it's a totally different paradigm of being. But I'm arguing, and Berto is arguing, that it's about energy. It's about moving that energy from protecting yourself to moving that energy about being in touch with God and being creative in your response to others. It's a self-generating energy. And our spiritual growth is to move from one to another, one paradigm to another, one way of seeing ourselves to another. And as we get more to the core of who we are, to ourself, and identify our worth and value more with the God that is there, we'll have more of our energy dedicated to that right? More of ourself will be dedicated to that. And it is the sharing of our bodies, right? So, you know, the funny thing about food is it's separate from us, but once we eat it, it becomes part of us. And taking in the body of Christ allows us to share ourselves with others. It is nourishing in a way that generates this energy. And that's what the Eucharist is all about. It's why we don't go celebrate the Eucharist all by ourselves and alone, as if it's a private connection between us and God. We do it with other people because it is fundamentally about the presence of God that emerges in all of us as we eat the bread and we eat the wine. That's why it's such a valued sacrament to us, right? An outward and visible sign of an inward and invisible grace. And I don't think, or at least I do not, live in the paradigm of community. Maybe one day will come when that's true in this life or the next, but I do glimpse it. And I often glimpse it when it's modeled for me, just as Greg modeled it as we were in that prison yard in Haiti. When it's modeled for me by my family or my church or my friends. And if I can do what I need to do to be food for others, to share my life, to lay down my life, if you will, for them, to step away from protecting those descriptive adjectives and into sharing with other people, I am much more alive. And I bet you are too. So I want you to take another moment and I want you to think about three times in your life where you've had that experience, where you found yourself in that 
communion paradigm where what you felt your worth was about was about the sharing of that energy. Take another 30 seconds. And I, I'm wondering if anyone identified a circumstance or an experience that they are willing to share. George, George, George. Oh, George. Turn those off. Sorry. I've got hey, only man. one now. Yeah. Hang on, that's okay. All right, this is John. I'm sorry for all the, the confusion. I thought There's it was dark later. later. Forget it. Forget it. <laughs> I think you need to turn it. Okay, well, hopefully John will get that reverb fixed. Anyone else? Um, I would, I'm thinking of a time when I was a chaplain and I went into a patient's room and the patient had actually gone to surgery. The bed wasn't in there, but the room was full of about four women relatives. And they were all a different race than I, but all of a sudden I said, it came to me, this is, this is a sisterhood. And we all joined hands and prayed for that patient. And every, I mean, it was this instant community and it was just so memorable. George, I think we've resolved our issue now. Sorry for that confusion. Excellent. But uh, what occurred to me was uh, when I used to do a lot of uh, work when I was young uh, with youth and church, and I loved your, uh, your phrase of giving love away. And it reminded me of a, uh, a children's song we used to sing uh, that said, love is something when you give it away, it's just like a magic penny, hold it tight and you won't have any, lend it, spend it, and you'll have so many, they'll roll all over the floor. <laughs> oh, I like that. George, I, 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 an example that, that came to my mind was when I was in, um, in Africa, I uh, was responsible for about five, ad, five different advertising agencies. And the traditional relationship between the client and the advertising agencies you know the client's the big boss so the, the you know kind of the client plays the lord the lord over the agencies you know you tell them what to do and they just kind of do it uh, without question and i remember this session though where we all came weekend and over pizza we just kind of sat down and and just kind of work through the problem and 
after about 20 minutes, you couldn't tell who was the client and who was the agency. We were just bonding and kind of working, writing things on the whiteboard and brainstorming and just coming up with new ideas. And by the end of the meeting, it was kind of, no one could tell whose idea it was. Like even the five agencies couldn't even tell which of the agencies had come up with the idea. They couldn't tell whether it was the client's, our idea is the client or their idea is the agency. And it didn't matter. It was just kind of like, wow, we, we nailed it. We figured it, we all figured it out. And that feeling of kind of, we were all in it together. We were kind of all kind of cr cracked it as one community just kind of propelled us so forward that it felt like we could, we could succeed in anything. I'd like to share. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, uh, I'd like to share a, an experience or a type of experience. Uh, I used to be uh, a former English ESOL teacher. And for those who might not be familiar with the acronym ESOL, it's E-S-O-L, which stands for English Speakers of Other Languages. And I taught in public school. And the, uh, the loving part that you mentioned is what came to my mind because there were different kinds of love that I wanted to express, had to express out of necessity or, or in other areas. Uh, for the particularly the Spanish speakers that I had, I had students from five different countries, but the Spanish speakers were the ones that that came to me for help most of the time, and I was happy to help them. And uh, as my students, we related on a lot of different levels. Uh, oftentimes, I would have to translate for them. For instance, one time, uh, the people from the Georgia Power Company came to the public school where I was and the family had not been able to pay their electric bill and the mother had not signed on the appropriate line and that kind of thing. And so I was kind of the sausage in between the Spanish speaking parents and students who were just learning English and Georgia Power. And I would have to translate and explain. And that's a different kind of love to me in taking care of my students. And of course, they would always invite me uh, when their babies were born. These are 15 year old girls. Their babies would be born or I would be invited to their quinceaneras or, so there were all kinds of love expressed just in that one area of my life alone. And I cherish those memories. And oftentimes when I'm out at the grocery, me, me, remember me? Yes, I do. So it was a very rewarding, very rich experience sharing about four or five different kinds of love just in that one little group of students. What came to mind for me was um, years ago, I was very involved in a homeless ministry in Marietta. And at one point, um, I had a uh, recovery church service there. And so often, I mean, I would like initiate the service, but once it began, everybody who was there then joined in. I mean, people would, sh would share their uh, gifts of being able to sing, their poetry, um, their faith, how they love God. And all of a sudden, we were just a one group of people, a community, worshiping God. Bonnie? Well, it, uh, a long time ago, I was teaching a middle school choir. And, and all but one in my choir were African-American. And we learned a song called Jazz Gloria, which had wonderful rhythm. And on our, our Christmas concert, they said, oh, Miss Bonnie, can we rock on the last verse? And I said, well, of course you can. And I was playing the piano. And there was this incredible realization that I was no longer the teacher. I was part of them and they were part of me. And the crowd went wild, but it was such a 
joy-filled moment when there was no longer any division between any of us, but we were one. Those were wonderful examples. Did I, I know there sometimes there are other hands that I don't see. I do want to say here again, the, um, I mean, these are such wonderful examples and there, at least in my life, there's so many of them. I, I personally have been trying lately to pay attention to kind of um, how I react to people who are trying to give me advice or telling stories and how often my instinctive reaction is to tell a better story or to tell them I already knew that, right? As a way as if I'm somehow slipping and I need to anchor myself. And, and when I can manage not to do that, but instead to say, that's a great story or thank you for that, not in a way that's not genuine, but in a way that is accepting and appreciative. It's, it's interesting how the relationship kind of there, there's additional energy right then to stay with my kind of metaphor, right? There's, there's just additional energy right there. And I wind up being a whole lot better off than I would have been had I simply asserted my better story or my knowledge base. And again, it's just a pedestrian example. And yet, if I pay attention to it, I can feel it. And over time, hopefully it'll become more a part of who I am and maybe helpful to you too. I want to say as we kind of wind down that if you kind of pay attention to the, the energy that is present in the domination paradigm and present in the communion paradigm, you'll see some key differences. In the domination paradigm, it's always asymmetrical, right? There's always being who's determining other beings, and that is a scarcity, and the energy is limited because some that you have to offer for others is limited because you're spending so much time protecting yourself, whether you know it or not. Where in the communion paradigm, the energy seems to arise out of abundance and to be ceaseless. And the well, if you will, is, is without bottom. But there's a symmetry there. When Jesus says, you're no longer servants, you're friends, he's talking about a reciprocity of being. That I, by letting you be, I am more. And that's just a very different way of walking in the world. And paying attention to it, being intentional about it, will over time transform us as we will draw us closer to God and it will allow us to make those movements from backing away from all those adjectives. So the spot that we occupied as we looked onto the world before, we now see that more as an object and we distance ourselves from it and take up a new spot, right? And I think that's what the journey is really all about. And doing it together is a must if we're going to actually live into that communion paradigm. All right. Um, any final comments or thoughts before we see what colic might emerge from our collective experience? I just have a comment. I met um, Beatrice Bordeaux uh, years ago. She was very close friends with the Swami at the Vedanta Center, and she was speaking there. And was a lovely person. Yeah, and I, well, I'm glad you mentioned that. I, I read recently a book that was kind of a tribute to her, and, and as brilliant as this woman was, and as many kind of grand things that she did, invariably, the stories they came out were, well, we were at the, you know, cafeteria with her on Sunday, and she just jumped up and started playing with a baby in the booth next door. I mean, it was that kind of stuff, which I think is really the energy that I'm talking about, right? And so it's wonderful to see somebody that kind of gifted, right, who's using their gifts by giving their lives away, which she so clearly did. So thank you for that, and I hope you like her. Okay, so our colleague then, you will remember that there is an invocation or address, right? some reference to God, one of the names of God, perhaps. There's an acknowledgement, a description of a divine attribute of God, a petition, something we'd like to have or receive or, or become aware of, an aspiration, what we would do with that, and a pleading, that is a concluding. You're generally a call for Christ. So I'm gonna go through each of those elements and just ask you to add 
what's come to you during class. And if you <clears> haven't, <throat> don't worry about it. We're going to keep doing this so you'll have a chance to participate later. The Lord be with you. Also, also with you. you. Let us pray. First, the invocation. Most gracious God, we children of God, divine creator, giver of all good gifts, author of all being, be with us in our hearts, Help us to respond to you, to respond to the challenges which confront us on an almost daily basis during these trying times, based upon a love of you with our whole heart and the love of our neighbors as ourselves. So that we can be the people you have created us to be and do the things you have created us to do. That Help your us. hand would be with us. Help us to connect with you. Help us to forgive our debtors as many times as it takes to manifest true forgiveness. Help us. Help us to listen. So that we may see with your eyes, listen with your ears, speak with your lips, and love with your heart. So that we can come to know you more deeply. So that we may be filled with the joy of knowing that all your creatures are important and loved. That we see you in all things. And help us to hear with our heart and with our ears. Going out into the world in our everyday lives. In the name of the one who shared his body and blood with us, Jesus Christ, your only Son. Amen. 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 Well, thank you. Thank you. Join us next week as we dive deeper into Bruteau's ideas of foot washing and communion all in a hope that we grow closer to God together. Go in peace, to love, and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Be to God. Thanks, George. Bye. Bye.